Uh, as the Minister outlined in her video welcome, we're also delighted this evening to be launching the findings from research into the early donor conception records in Victoria. The final report, which is available tonight for those of you who don't yet have a copy up the back, I believe, was prepared for VARTA by Dr Fiona Kelly, who is the Associate Professor in Law at La Trobe University, and Dr Deborah Dempsey, Associate Professor in Sociology at Swinburne University. VARTA would like to thank the Department of Health and Human Services for funding the research. And to talk more about the research and its findings, I would like to welcome Dr Fiona Kelly to the stage. Thank you, Kirsten, and good evening, everybody. It's a great honor to be able to share the stage tonight with Emeritus Professor Louis Waller, Minister Hennessy, and Dr. Lauren Burns, who will follow me today, to launch the History of Donor Conception Records in Victoria report. This has been an extraordinary project to be part of, and I want to begin by giving my thanks to a number of people who made it possible. Uh, firstly, to my co-author, Deborah Dempsey, whose insight and careful analysis made working on this project an absolute pleasure. To Dr. Bryony Horsfall, who's unable to be here tonight, but who provided invaluable research assistance throughout the project. Thank you also to the staff at VARTA, but in particular, Louise Johnson, Kate Bourne, and Marjorie Solomon for all of their support and practical assistance. And finally, to the most important contributors of all, the donors, parents, clinicians, and policymakers, who were willing to come forward and share their recollections with us of a time that we often look back on with a very critical eye. So thank you to those people for coming forward. As you would all be aware, in 2016, Victoria's donor records were opened retrospectively, giving all donor conceived people the ability to know who their donor was. However, to make this promise real and enforceable, it was necessary for Victoria's pre-1988 donor records to be found, to be located, and to be preserved. In some instances, this had already happened, but there remained gaps in our knowledge. The aim of this project was to determine what information was gathered about donors, how it was recorded and managed, how it, uh, where the records were stored, and where those records are located today. Information from, for the report was obtained primarily from interviews that we conducted with medical and scientific staff from each of the three sites where donor conception occurred in the pre-1988 period. So Queen Victoria Hospital, the Royal Women's Hospital, and Prince Henry's. Interviews were also conducted with donors, recipient parents, staff from the relevant government department, members of the Waller Committee, and employees of the then Infertility Treatment Authority. We also drew on archival information that was kept at VARTA and other secondary sources. We found that the experiences and practices at the three sites did vary, but we're able to make a number of overall findings which we will present to you this evening. Perhaps the most notable was that detailed records were kept, often quite meticulously, and that a substantial number of those records remain today. However, because the underlying principle of the time was anonymity, the focus of the record keeping practices was on making sure that the donor's identity was kept separate from a patient's treatment record. So at all of the sites, donors completed forms which provided basic personal and medical information, though the amount of that information increased quite dramatically during the period of time we studied. Once this initial intake information had been recorded, donors were assigned a donor code. And donor codes were at the heart of the system of anonymity. All subsequent paperwork, including information about which recipient received a donor's sperm, recorded only the code. So for example, at Prince Henry's, each donor literally had a small file card that was kept separate from his intake form in a locked filing cabinet in the andrology lab, which identified him solely on the basis of his code. And it was this card that clinicians then used to record who had received his semen, the date of the insemination, Pregnancies were recorded with a P on the card and births with a B. 
Recipients were also identified by number. So as one of the Prince Henry's clinicians explained to us, what happened is, let's say that one nurse knew that Mary Smith, number 1457, got pregnant. They would tell the andrology lab that 1457 got pregnant with B6, which was recorded on the card. So they would keep a tally. They also looked at the efficacy of the various donors. So perhaps our most important finding was that clinicians kept detailed records of donors, recipients, inseminations and pregnancies, and that many of those records have survived intact. However, reflecting the attitude of the time, they were records designed to ensure the integrity of a system of anonymity. So as one of the counselors from Royal Women's noted, in the early days, it was all about secrecy. The second key finding of the report was that while legal regulation of the industry didn't come into force until July of 1988, clinics, knowing that the reform was on its way, began changing their practices much earlier. This meant that many of the dona donors that who, who donated in the early to mid-1980s were in fact aware that anonymity might cease at some point in the future and that their identities may be disclosed. For example, in the mid-1980s, social workers who were attached to the donor program at the Royal Women's began talking to donors about the possibility that the law would no longer preserve anonymity. The Royal Women's social work team were experienced in supporting adoptive parents and believed there was potentially parallels with donor conception with regard to the shift in attitude towards openness. So as one of the social workers explained to us, because we were coming out of an adoption model and we had seen the significant changes happening there, we explored with the potential donors their motivations, implications for them in the future, the issues around children being informed or finding out in the future, and possibly that the laws would change. By 1985, all intake forms at Queen Victoria explicitly asked donors whether they would will be willing to meet their offspring when they reached adulthood. So it might be difficult to see that slide, but at the very bottom there's a question and that particular donor has circled yes, that he would be willing to, uh, to have his identity released to offspring. Perhaps the most interesting pre-reform changes happened at Prince Henry's. In 1986, two years before the legislation came into force, a young scientist, who we've called Rose, was hired to oversee the andrology lab and to revamp the donor program. The doctors at Prince Henry's were concerned that many of the donors they had recruited in the past were not suited to the era of openness required by the new legislation. Rose reported that the future of the Prince Henry's program, sorry, that the director of the Prince Henry's program told her, quote, it was going to be a lot more open in the future. Rose explained to us what that meant in practice. They wanted me to completely redo the way we attracted donors, treated donors, and educated our donors so that we would be prepared for the future. So they wanted me to increase the number and they wanted me to change the type of person we accepted. These were not hard and fast rules, but we came together with the agreement that our donors should be married, they should have children of their own because they had proven fertility, but they also had a better understanding of what it, was, what it is to be a father. We were trying to get donors who were either educated or educable, donors who were prepared to understand that things can change in the future. That was my goal, that I would try to discuss with them and just see what their attitude might be to the idea of their identity one day actually being given out to people. And then the other thing that we felt that we needed to do was have a bit more of an altruistic kind of attitude. In other words, not just doing it for the money. So that was my job, to make that happen. Rose screened the new donors by discussing with them the possibility of identity disclosure, explaining that the doctors at the program, quote, really believe this is going to be the way of the future. Men who reacted negatively were not chosen. So one of the key findings from this research is that a significant number of donors who donated in the mid to early 1980s were aware that the law may change 
and that the era of donor, donor anonymity would end. The other important finding was that many of these donors, and this was supported both by the donors we interviewed as well as uh, research that was in fact conducted with donors in uh, the early 1980s, that they indicated a willingness to have their identities revealed to their donor offspring. So when we talk in the modern era about the implications of retrospective laws, it's important to realize that donors were to some degree prepared for this possibility as far back as the early 1980s, and that a significant number, though not all, indicated their support for it at the time. The final key finding the project that I wanted to share with you tonight was the discovery of additional records from the Queen Victoria program that, we had, that had not previously been available to VARTA. While the donor records from the Royal Women's and Prince Henry's had been located and preserved some time ago, the Queen Victoria records were thought to have been inadvertently lost or destroyed when the program moved from the Epworth Hospital to the Monash Medical Centre at Clayton in 1987. This version of events was repeated by a number of the clinicians we spoke to. However, during the course of our interviews with donors and clinicians from the Queen Vic program, it became apparent that while the donor records themselves may have been lost or destroyed, related documentation, including what was referred to as a pregnancy book, was in the possession of Monash IVF. Since obtaining this information, Monash IVF has provided VARTA with the pregnancy book and other related documentation. And we understand that this new information has enabled additional donor linking to occur. So we hope that this report sheds some new light on the record keeping practices of the pre-1988 period. And in particular, we hope it provides those who were conceived during this time with some additional insight into the context of their conception. Thank you.